I'd like to take a look at multiple intelligences now, one by one, specifically as they apply to different types of people and the uh, implications that those have on the language classroom as we consider um, the types of learners that our students might be. Once again, the intelligences, the eight that I'm going to focus on, bodily kinesthetic, interpersonal, verbal linguistic, logical mathematical, naturalistic, intrapersonal, visual spatial, and musical. Uh, as far as remembering these eight intelligences, uh, I suppose if you are a logical oriented learner, you might want to memorize some kind of a uh, um, mnemonic, B-I-V-L-N-I-V-M, and attach that to, you know, some other words that are easier to remember. Um, personally, I'm somewhat of a visual learner, so these um, icons and colors help me. And that's actually how I'm going to look at each intelligence, is uh, with a bit of a visual presentation. So let's go. Bodily kinesthetic learners, these are people who rely on coordination, balance, strength, and the use of their hands. Actors, mimes, athletes, and dancers are all bodily kinesthetic um, learners. Mechanics and surgeons are examples of some other more um, uh, realistic professions that, that uh, people might be going toward. And in the classroom, uh, t total physical response could be an application um, of teaching for learners who are oriented to this um, particular intelligence. Physical games, games that um, take place in the gymnasium that involve movement, um, games like rock, paper, scissors, gestures and skits that uh, take place in front of the class that can, can link language and, and physical motion. Even things like jumping jacks are something that I've used in class to kind of uh, wake, awaken students' bodies and, and get them active in the classroom. Next we have the interpersonal intelligence, emphasis on inter. I've bolded that there. Uh, people who are heavily interpersonal would be teachers, salesmen, politicians and leaders, as well as counselors, people who are good at um, empathizing with others, working effectively with others, working in groups. Um, examples of this in the classroom, group work, pairs, um, groups of four, four to six, I often do groups of six. Um, peer teaching, um, learners focusing on one particular uh, aspect of a subject and teaching it to their peers. Um, board games are one that um, are mentioned in our course text and uh, can be quite, quite effective and fun. Um, anything that emphasizes communication, even uh, 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 gap exercises could be examples of interpersonal communication. Verbal linguistic learners. Uh, these are people who might be authors, uh, writers, playwrights, news anchors, people who give speeches for a living, motivational speakers, as well as comedians. Comedians are essentially playing with language. Uh, many of them are. A good example of that is, is George Carlin here. Um, in the classroom, wordplay. Uh, personally, I get a lot out of puns, making new puns in the foreign language, and I always encourage this in my learners, even as, as painful as it can be to some. Storytelling, uh, debating, uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I enjoy a good argument. Reading, things like literature, focusing on the literature of the, the, the target language, as well as skits, uh, which could also be um, interpersonal, interpersonal and um, bodily kinesthetic. Then there are learners who are logical and mathematical. These might be people like computer programmers, uh, physicists, scientists, mathematicians, um, accountants, engineers, and, and doctors, people who look at evidence, apply um, scientific reasoning to data and problems. Um, and this might 
uh, result in learners who, who are more interested in, in the grammar of a language. Uh, this might help people more than others. So in the classroom, you might actually encourage learners to make their own scientific inquiries, make observations, draw conclusions, write up the report. Uh, logic problems, um, you know, problems that employ the, the actual logical descriptions within language to make learners think. Codes. Uh, often I have my students who are learning the ABCs and numbers at elementary level make those uh, kind of spinner codes where A is 1 and B is 2 and C is 3 and you can um, uh, adjust the code to, to have different numbers represent different letters. They like that. Programming in the second language. Uh, deductive explanations of linguistic features. And patterns. Uh, patterns within language, um, even rhymes, could be um, appealing to logical mathematical learners. Next we have naturalistic learners. Um, these are people who might be biologists, botanists, there's a very famous botanist, the only one I can think of. Um, farmers are people who are in touch, have to be in touch with the, the natural environment. Many of them are my students, future farmers. Gardeners and cooks. This, this one seems a little harder to apply to the classroom, but but uh, just trying to think outside of the box, field trips where people uh, have to venture into the real world to apply language and, and connect language to certain other features. Recording observations. Uh, examples of this might be when students learn weather. They could make a, just a simple logbook of what the weather was like um, from day to day. Uh, nature vocabulary, you could, you could conduct a lesson that focuses specifically on vocabulary to describe the features of nature in their, in their hometown or in their country. Things like photography and geography um, could also be appealing to naturalistic intelligences. Um, sometimes I'll have my elementary learners uh, design countries and they have to think about the the geography of their country. Is it mountainous? Is it an island? Is it surrounded by other countries? Are there, is there an ocean? Are there lakes? Uh, what kind of land do the people live on? Next we have intrapersonal intelligence. Uh, these are people who might be psychiatrists, psychologists, spiritual leaders, those people who can understand other people, not necessarily work well with other people, although that's um, um, a requirement, but people who are in tune with other people's feelings as well as their own feelings. I feel it's, it's important to distinguish this from interpersonal intelligences. Um, other occupations might be caretakers, nurses, and even doctors, although I did um, list that under logical mathematical earlier. Um, philosophers. Um, I suppose even physicists could exhibit this intelligence. Um, Basically, people who are in touch with themselves, but also with the general zeitgeist, I suppose, to use a, a, a big word, um, of society and the ways that people feel and think. Um, classroom applications might be journaling. People can express their own feelings. Um, this could also appeal to learners who are um, specifically, what's the word, shy, who might not always be willing to share their own thoughts and feelings in an open forum with 20 or 30 classmates. They might benefit from um, writing down their own thoughts only for their own eyes or for the, just, just between them and the teacher. Independent study. Um, writing advice columns is something that I, I think people could, of this intelligence, could benefit from. Uh, blogging, uh, it's a social act, but it's also very, very personal. Um, it's something that you do almost for yourself, even, even as it's for, you know, the eyes of the internet. Uh, private study, not quite the same as independent study, but um, focusing on a, a specific, uh, um, something specific, studying in their own way. I, I imagine the, uh, the little study carols at the libraries that would, 
appeal to interpersonal learners. Um, and learners who are able to self-pace. Uh, this might be um, hard to do in a classroom with, with many different um, students of different backgrounds, but it might be applicable in some situations. Uh, the seventh intelligence we have is visual-spatial. Um, like I said, I find myself to be um, probably strongest in this intelligence, and, I, and it reflects itself in the things that I produce, like this, this, this video here. Um, advertising is very visual-spatial. Uh, people who um, are architects are, are very reliant on visual-spatial thinking. They have to connect their thoughts to, to physical space. Uh, cartographers, uh, this is Amerigo Vespucci from a Family Guy episode, they have to imagine physical space, 3D space in 2D. Cartoonists or um, illustrators are also required of this. Um, painters, as well as drafters, although this profession is perhaps not as uh, uh, common these days with CAD applications, but still visual spatial. Classroom applications might be mind maps uh, rather than bulleted lists or, or sort of drab black and white blocks of texts. Lear learners might benefit, benefit from organizing linguistic knowledge uh, visually in, in 2D or even 3D space. Describing rooms, describing the relationships um, between uh, certain objects. This is actually a, a common activity in some interactionist studies of language learning um, is describing where objects are in, in relation to others in space. Making images and posters, decorations, adding color, making videos. Uh, students can, can put this kind of knowledge into uh, um, practice with videos. Obviously photography and drawing could also be um, used to appeal to these learners. These could be optional. I think that's one of the benefits of, um, of understanding these eight intelligences is, is you can leave things open-ended for learners but also understand what, uh, what, things might be op what things might appeal to people rather than saying okay you all have to make videos um, you might be able to say give it, give it as an option. Final intelligence is musical intelligence, which I feel is one of the the, sh the more uh, discreet, uh, easy to understand of the eight intelligences. Obviously, singers, um, songwriters uh, are musical composers, um, uh, people who focus on instruments, and those who uh, engineer music, engineer sound, deal with sound. In the classroom, obviously, listening to music, listening to music from the target language, from the target culture, can uh, give students some implicit knowledge about uh, that culture and that language that they may, might not get from the teacher and might not get from other avenues. Playing live music, if you have a class <laughs> who can do this, do it. Making instruments could be one. Um, the act of, of creating could be part of, of language learning. Uh, jazz chants. I'm sure many of you are familiar with jazz chants. Not just singing music, but uh, re-mapping um, language onto to rhythm in order to, to acquire it through a different intelligence. Mood music. Just playing music in the background sometimes can uh, benefit certain learners. Uh, music that are rounds, uh, songs like Row, Row, Row Your Boat, uh, while very simple, can really focus learners' attention on uh, the placement of words and the, the rhythm of words and when they need to, pay, when they need to enter, you have, to, you have to pay attention to, to do rounds like this. Uh, writing new lyrics for existing songs, rewriting lyrics, really focuses on uh, the syllables in words, on what the original meaning of the song was, uh, it forces learners to be, you know, to have a comprehension, a wider comprehension of, of the song and what they're writing. Uh, last, any rhythm games, adding a rhythm to 
something that's otherwise uh, rote memory or, or boring can be can be effective. 